pernah mendengar seseorang yang kamu kenal atau bahkan kerabat dekatmu mengalami kanker kelenjar tiroid kan? Apa sih sebenarnya penyebab sampai orang tersebut bisa mengalami kanker kelenjar tiroid? Apakah penyakit itu bisa disembuhkan? Untuk pengobatan kanker kelenjar tiroid, apakah harus selalu dengan metode operasi? Berikut penjelasan lengkap dari Dr. Harold He, spesialis THT dari Rumah Sakit Ferret Park Hospital, Singapura. Mind they can be cancerous, um, and generally, salivary glands. Like if you look at the salivary gland, like that, the big salivary gland, like the parotid gland. Uh, The parotid gland tumors, majority of them tend to be benign. Only about 25% or one quarter are cancerous. But as the glands get smaller, for example, submandibular gland, which is the second largest, the risk of cancer is about 50% for the tumors there. And if you talk about sublingual glands and the minor salivary glands, if there are tumors there, then majority of them are cancerous. So in, in general, if you have a growth in the salivary gland, something that's been there for a few weeks or months, you know, it's a good idea to get it checked out rather than to wait until it gets very large. So this is a very young girl. I think she was only 16 or 17 years old. And uh, she was brought to see me by her grandfather, her grandparents, huh, because um, of this lump in the neck. And the grandparents say that actually she had it for a few years already. It's just that the uh, her own her own parents neglected to uh, send her to seek medical attention. So you have the grandparents that actually brought her to see me. And you know, when you feel it, it feels very firm, hard. And obviously it's not infective. It's not, it's not painful when I press on it. And she has had it there for at least uh, three, four years already. And it's just slowly grown in size. This is an example of a parotid gland tumor. And this lady, uh, She actually came from overseas, either Cambodia or Myanmar. And, and I'm not sure whether you can see it, but actually she has a, a swelling in the below the jaw on the left side here. And if I shine a light on it, it actually lights up. This is actually a silocele. It's actually uh, a cyst in the submandibular gland region that is filled with uh, saliva. So it lights up like almost like a light bulb. And she had surgery for it uh, maybe one or two years ago, uh, prior to coming by, by her surgeons back home. But Obviously, it wasn't treated, so it came back again. And this is an example of a sublingual swelling. So you can see it's a lump under the tongue on the left side here. So it's very small, smooth, cystic kind of lump. And it's been there for a few months already. Also, similarly, not causing the, the patient any pain or discomfort. You just notice that there's a lump under the tongue. It sometimes makes her feel a bit uncomfortable. And in, in the worst case scenario, um, sometimes the tumor in the, in the gland, if it's uh, cancerous, it can affect the, the surrounding structures. In this case, this man actually presents with this, I'm not sure whether you can see this, but his right half of his face is actually paralyzed. So you can see that this is the normal side. And when they're resting this size on the muscle, has, it's all paralyzed, so it's drooping. And he can't close his eyes, so you can see the white of his eyes as well. So when he tries to smile or show the teeth, you can see there's no movement here. And this area is all flattened out compared to the normal side. In this situation, this, this man actually had a, a, a cancer in the right parotid gland that has invaded the facial nerve. So she has paralysis of the right face. Actually, he has no pain or anything. He just he just presented with this weakness in the, in the face. But unfortunately, they, they, he didn't think much of it because he wasn't causing any pain. So he sat on it for a few months before coming. Unfortunately, we couldn't save the, 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 the nerve because the nerve has been invaded by the, by the tumor. So what are the investigations that we do? Um, unlike the thyroid, the investigation of choice is actually the CT scan or MRI. We might do a thyroid scan in, in the clinic uh, just to confirm that it's arising from the, the, the salivary gland. But uh, the problem with the ultrasound scan for the for salivary glands is that you can't see very deep. So for example, you can scan the parotid, but you can't see deeper because um, the ultrasound is blocked. The ultrasound waves cannot penetrate the bone that's underlying, so you cannot see deeper part. Whereas this MRI scan can actually show that the tumor is extending very deep inside. And 
similar to before, um, one of the investigations of choice is to do an ultrasound guided um, uh, biopsy, the needle biopsy or cytology. So you can use a needle, find the tumor using the ultrasound, uh, use the needle to sample cells from the, the, the tumor itself. But the problem with slivery glands is that even though it's useful to distinguish between an infection or a tumor, it's very hard to tell based on the cytology to distinguish between a, a low-grade kind of cancer versus a benign tumor. So oftentimes, the recommendation is still surgery for, for slivery glands. So like I mentioned, uh, the treatment of choice is still surgery. And the kind of surgery really depends on the type of tumor and location. So for example, if it's a parotid tumor, then you need to do a parotidectomy or parotid surgery to remove it. If it's a submandibular gland, a tumor, you do a submandibular gland excision. So the incision and the kind of surgery depends on where the tumor is uh, sitting on. So for parotid, usually you have to make a face and neck incision. And the main structure at risk is the facial nerve, which supplies the muscles on the face. Huh? If you if you're submandibular then you have to make an incision in the neck. And then the, the two main nerves that are at risk are the hypoglossal nerve, which supplies your tongue, as well as the lingual nerve, also supplying the tongue. So if it's damaged, you find that your tongue cannot move, and then there's no taste or feeling on the tongue. And when you talk about sublingual, the, the main thing is that you can do an incision sometimes just in the mouth alone. And the, the slivery dark and the nerve as well are at risk. Sometimes uh, we might add on radiation therapy as well. So you must remember that the, the mainstay of treatment is still surgery. It's only whether you want to add on a radiation treatment to increase the success rate and just reduce the chance of the tumor coming back. And it's certainly useful for um, some kinds of uh, slivery brain cancer. Um, people always ask uh, what, kind, what, what kind of uh, incision, you know, is, is it possible to make the incision less obvious? So the traditional uh, slivery gland surgery incision is actually this thing called modified flare. So it actually comes down in front of the ear, down into the neck, in front of the, the side of the neck. But um, we have moved towards some more cosmetically uh, peeling kind of surgery. So you can hide the incision in the hairline or you just curve it behind and backwards so that there's no incision in the neck. And after it heals, usually it's not so obvious. So this is an example of the incision that we pull behind. So you can imagine if you let the hair down, then this thing is healed. Most people can't really tell whether you've gone for surgery or not. And uh, obviously, you assume that your, your facial nerve is not damaged. Yeah. Um, moving on to oral cavity or the mouth. So when we talk about mouth, actually, to doctors, the mouth is quite a complicated area. It's not just, just the oral cavity. There are many, many structures inside. And you, you can go from the lips to the, the gums. You can talk about the soft palate, hard palate, the, the oral tongue, the floor of mouth, the trigon, the buccal mucosa. So many, many different areas in the oral cavity. But generally, the lumps and the tumors, they, are, they, they arise from the lining of the oral cavity, which is like the mucus lining the skin. And this kind of tumors and cancers, the main risk factor is still smoking and alcohol. And some people say sharp teeth, because if you have a teeth that are very sharp, uh, that keeps cutting against your tongue or your lips or your gums, you can cause chronic, chronic inflammation and ulceration that over time, if you don't treat it, can actually turn cancerous as well. So this is an example of what uh, tongue tumors can look like. So this is the tongue cancer. You can present as a lump in the tongue, very ugly looking or sometimes it's not so obvious you can just be an ulcer that is on, on the side of the tongue um, this is the most common and it tends to be area where it rubs against the teeth right? so you can imagine it keeps rubbing against the teeth over time the ulcer doesn't heal then it turns uh, malignant or turns cancerous this is not actually cancer yet but this is something called leukoplakia you can see this white whitish skin change and this is associated with about anywhere from uh, 1 to 15% risk of cancerous change. So usually when we see leukoplakia, if you try to rub it, it doesn't come out. Then uh, you should do a biopsy and make sure that it's not cancer uh, or there's no cancerous change. Conversely, if you rub it uh, and then it disappears, then it's, probably, it's just candida. It's just a, a trash, oral trash infection. So that one is not, uh, not there's no need to biopsy that, obviously. This is a patient, uh, I saw an old lady who wears dentures um, 
80 something old lady wears dentures. Then she complained her dentures don't fit properly. And uh, her family finally uh, took a look and then they noticed that this, there's this uh, growth on the gums under the dentures that's preventing the dentures to sit properly. And this is, uh, and then it turns out to be a verrucous cancer of the upper alveolus. So it's a very slow growing kind of cancer. Mendengar istilah tumor otak, tumor payudara sepertinya sudah biasa ya. Tapi, pernahkah kalian mendengar ada seseorang yang mengidap tumor kelenjar air liur? Tumor kelenjar air liur sendiri termasuk salah satu penyakit yang ditangani oleh dokter spesialis THT. Apa tumor ini bisa muncul? Apakah kebiasaan merokok juga menjadi salah satu penyebabnya? Lalu, bagaimana cara mengobatinya? Apakah bisa sembuh total tanpa meninggalkan kecacatan? Simak penjelasan Dr. Harold yang berikut ini. This is a 50 year old man also wear dentures and then because he wear dentures nobody check under the dentures and eventually he was complaining of a lot of pain and bleeding. He took out the denture you saw this the if you look carefully uh, there's actually a hole from the mouth going into the nose. The, the tumor has actually eaten and eroded away the, the skin and the bone. So now his uh, mouth and his nostril, nasal cavity is communicating with this hole. And obviously, after we I did a biopsy, this turned out to be cancerous. Huh? So this is a heart palate cancer, a squamous cell cancer. And this is also another 80, 90-year-old woman, smoker and drinker for many years. Same thing, uh, had dentures, then was having difficulty fitting the dentures. Then eventually the, the family noticed that she has a lump here. And you can see that it's quite big already and it's a big ulcer that was not cleaning. This is an upper lip cancer. So for oral cavity cancers, uh, they are, it's not one of the top 10, it's the 11th most uh, common cancer in the world. And generally you see it more common in uh, countries that have a lot of smoking and drinking. It's more common in men, twice, uh, twice more common in men than women. And most of the patients are, tend to be elderly. Uh. Only one out of five patients are less than 55 years old. Uh, as mentioned before, the highest risk factors are those people who have been smoking and drinking for many years. That's why you always see the cigarette packets now. They have all these risk uh, pictures of oral cavity cancers, you know, lip cancer, tongue cancer, things like that, in, in a bit to try to encourage people to stop, stop uh, smoking and drinking. And they can present various ways, can be a non-healing ulcer that's been there for like a few weeks or months, not getting better or getting larger. It can be a white patch like I showed you. Sometimes they can have a lump in the neck, which is a lymph node. Now. And the management is, you need to see a, a doctor, preferably an ENT or head and neck specialist. You need to do a thorough head and neck examination. Eventually, if it's, if it's deemed necessary, you need to do imaging studies. No ultrasound, you, you should do a CT scan or MRI scan. And most important, if it's suspicious, you should biopsy the lesion. Which is a very short, small procedure. It only takes about 15-20 minutes to do only. And it gives you a lot of information. And once it's confirmed that if it's cancer, you need to do staging. And the treatment, I cannot emphasize this enough. For oral cavity cancers, um, the treatment of choice is still surgery. And then only if the patient cannot undergo surgery, then you consider radiation therapy or chemotherapy. It's never just radiation or chemotherapy for, for oral cavity cancers. So, I mean, I've seen, I've seen patients referred from other countries to Singapore and they've been treated. It may, maybe they don't have the surgical specialty, uh, surgical expertise there, or, or I'm not sure what the reason is, but the patients actually undergo the radiation or chemotherapy rather than surgery. So a lot of times, because especially if the tumor is very large, they don't respond to the, or they don't completely go away. Then you end up with a worse situation because tissues that have been radiated before, if you do surgery, they don't heal as well. They're more prone to getting infection. So like I said, surgery is still the main treatment modality and the kind of surgery depends on where the tumor is. Um, but because the mouth is quite an important structure, you need it to eat, drink, you need it to talk, to speak. Uh, especially the tongue, you know, your jawbone, things like that. So oftentimes um, I work with a, a plastic surgeon to do a reconstruction in the same sitting. So uh, for example, this man had a, had a cancer on the left side of the tongue. So after we resected it already, we actually took skin from the, from the arm 
to uh, to patch this area, to connect the blood vessels to the neck, and then uh, repair the, the tongue so that the, the patient is able to eat and drink almost as per normal. Um, so if, when you talk to him or that in the speech or that, it's still normal. Um, whether you add radiation therapy or not uh, depends on the, the stage of the cancer after the surgery as well. So sometimes if you're able to get clear margins and you find that there's no lymph node spread, you might even spare uh, spare the patient, you know, you don't have to go for radiation treatment. And that's that's really a, a, a big thing because if you've seen anyone who has undergone radiation, there's really a lot of side effects from the radiation. Um, the last area that I'll talk about is uh, neck lymph nodes and survival lymph nodes. Uh. So in your neck, uh, there are hundreds of these kind of lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are part of your lymphatic system. Uh, most people don't know what the lymphatic system is. If you think about it, it's like a uh, you know your blood vessels, you have a vascular system, blood all this uh, series of blood vessels, but adjacent to it or, or running very close, closely related to it, it's this thing called the lymphatic system that drains the, the serous fluid. So it doesn't contain the red blood cells they, and the lymph is usually colorless, but they are very important because they, they play an you know, important role in terms of uh, your immune response, immune system, but they also act as a conduit for spread of uh, cancer. A lot of times the uh, lymph nodes actually swell up um, because of the infection. But like I said before, um, because uh, they are a path of spread for cancer, they can be one of the one of the causes, especially if the lymph nodes don't respond or they don't get smaller after two to four weeks. And that means it's in there for a long time. So when, when that happens, we start uh, worrying whether is it cancer that has grown from somewhere that spread to the lymph nodes. Or it can be cancer of the lymph nodes themselves, something called lymphoma, which is one of the top 10 cancers. So, for example, this is how, how you might present, you know, uh, this is the ear lobe, you can have a lump here in the neck. But generally, you look at the neck, you have lymph nodes all over the neck, you have hundreds of lymph nodes in the neck, under the chin, under the jawbone, in front of the ear, along the whole uh, neck, all the way to the back, behind your head. And the lymph nodes are almost everywhere in the, in the neck area. And generally, if the nodes, the lumps uh, don't go away after more than four weeks, you should really see your doctor to get it uh, checked out. Uh, what do you need to do? You need to do a thorough head and neck examination. And uh, pref preferably, you should get someone who can do a flexible nasal pharyngoscopy. Uh, so it's like a, a scope that goes through your nose and goes all the way down to your, your, your throat and your voice box to make sure that there's no tumor that is growing there. Because if there's a tumor growing there, you probably can't tell or see unless you do a scope. Um, other investigations that you can do, you can do ultrasound to confirm that there are lymph nodes and whether the lymph nodes have a suspicious appearance on the ultrasound. CT scan, MRI scan, PET scan, all these are all very useful to image the nodes as well as to see whether there's a, a, a tumor somewhere that could have spread to the lymph nodes. And a PET CT will look at the whole body to see whether there's any other abnormal lymph nodes or abnormal tumors anywhere else in the whole body. But generally, of all these, the PET CT is by far the most uh, expensive, most invasive. So in terms of uh, affordability and access, ultrasound is probably the most affordable and accessible, followed by CT scan, then MRI scan, and then obviously the PET scan is the most costly. Um, same thing for lymph nodes. Uh, usually, if you suspect the lymph nodes is abnormal and you worry about cancer, you can do an ultrasound guided uh, needle biopsy or, or cytology. And if it's not enough cells or not enough information and you're still suspicious for, say, lymphoma, then you should do what we call an excision biopsy, a small operation to remove the lymph node for, for a proper investigation. So what's the management? Like I said, it depends on the cause of the enlarged lymph nodes. Generally, if you think it's infective, you need to start the appropriate anti, uh, antibiotic or antimicrobial. Um, if, if it responds well, then you know it's uh, obviously an infective cause. If the, the lymph nodes enlargement don't resolve after more than four weeks, then you should investigate it further. Uh, preferably, you do a needle biopsy or you do a, a ex excision biopsy. But do take note that in children, the reactive lymph nodes can take uh, quite a long time to resolve. So young kids with a uh, sore throat, fever, runny nose, cough, that kind of thing, the, the lymph nodes in the neck can actually last for up to four weeks uh, before it goes away. So generally for children, I tend to be, uh, I tend to wait a little bit.